time for us to check back in with Watermelon Hill and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. And if you'd like to purchase this book, you can visit watermelonhillbook.com. And I'll put that link in the description below too. Home Entertainment Center. Yes, we had a home entertainment center, even back in the 40s and 50s. Do you think we lived back in the hills or something? It was called radio, and we looked forward to our favorite radio shows with even more anticipation than people today with their favorite television shows. We were not jaded by all the entertainment options that are around today, so we welcomed whatever we did have access to. In addition to the radio, we had a hand-cranked Victrola and a number of old 78 RPM records bought at the second-hand store. The older ones were about one-fourth inch thick and only had recordings on one side. I recall one record that was actually put out by the Ku Klux Klan. It came across as patriotic and somewhat religious to mask its real message of hate and bigotry. I still have a two-record 78 RPM set of the story of Peter Rabbit, including the album cover that I got as a present in 1945. The Victrola was entertainment too, but radio was by far the most important to us. In those days, there was a wide range of radio shows day and night, not just music, news, and talk shows like today. There were soaps and variety shows during the day, comedy and adventure in the evening, and spooky shows at night. Something for all the family. Listening to the radio was really a family event. The first radio I remember in our house was about the size of a 25-inch floor model television with a dial about one inch square. It was an old tube radio, but even including the speakers, most of the inside was empty. It was sometimes difficult to tune in the show we wanted because of the reception. We lived on a hill, which was a plus, but that radio required an external antenna. We had a wire run out the window and connected to the metal clothesline for maximum reception, but it still wasn't the best. We would all crowd around the radio, listen to the shows, and try to ignore all the static. We later got a newer table model radio that had much better reception. Mom liked the soaps and would listen to them as she worked around the house, just as she would watch them on television years later. Some of the old radio shows carried over into television. One of Mom's favorites, The Guide and Light, was on television until just a few years ago. There was also Pepper Young's family and detective shows like Mr. and Mrs. North and variety shows like Don McNeil's Breakfast Club, The Arthur Godfrey Show, and The Hit Parade. In the afternoon, there were shows aimed at kids just home from school and just like kids' shows today, sponsored by breakfast cereals. There wasn't the huge variety that is available today, though. One of my favorite commercials was for Quaker Puffed Wheat shot from guns. I still don't know just what they were trying to say and how you could shoot wheat from guns. Those were the days of secret decoder rings, private inner circle clubs, and all sorts of gimmicks aimed at influencing kids to nag their parents into buying a particular cereal. I loved those after-school shows and listened to them anytime I wasn't doing chores. There was Sergeant Preston of the Yukon and his great lead dog, King, the Lone Ranger, hi -Yo Silver, Frank Bring em Back Alive, Buck, Little Orphan Annie, The Green Hornet, and many others. They had sound effects for everything from the wind to horses galloping to lions roaring. They wouldn't seem realistic now, but before television, we thought they were great. All the acting was quite melodramatic, too, but all the feeling of the scene had to be conveyed by sound, so they put extra drama into the script. Most of the classic old comedies were on in the evening in what we refer to as prime time. I loved them. There were Amos and Andy, The Great Gildersleeve, Baby Snooks, The Life of Riley, Henry Aldrich, Lum and Abner, Fibber McGee and Molly, etc. I know Amos and Andy carried over to television, and I saw an old movie with the great Gildersleeve. He was a small-town water commissioner of all things, but it was a funny show. 
Some of my favorites were on after my bedtime, so I always hoped my parents would forget, but they usually didn't. Sometimes I would have to go to bed, but could still hear the show. Radio did have some advantages over television. Later in the evening were the more creepy shows. That was where radio excelled. Your mind could create the scene, and it could be spookier than anything you can now see on television. Everyone's vision would be different and would probably reflect their own secret fears. My favorites were The Hermit's Cave, The Shadow, Who Knows What Evil Lurks in the Heart of Man, and The Inner Sanctum, which we all called The Creaking Door. Every show began with the sound of a door opening very slowly, creaking eerily as it opened, and ending with an echo and slam. I thought the sound effects on the inner sanctum were the best. When they did the telltale heart, it was so spooky, I wasn't sure if I was listening to the heart on the radio or the beating of my own heart. Sadly, the great old radio shows quickly drifted into yesteryear with the growing popularity of television in the early 50s. Now they can only be found on cassette in a few locations or possibly on the internet. One show, however, Radio Mystery Theater, was still on radio in the 70s and well into the 80s. My son and daughter were young teenagers by that time and were crazy about it. They said the best part was being able to imagine what was happening and not just look at it. We would usually hear it in the car late at night when we were traveling somewhere. Once on a trip, they both wanted me to stop at a restroom, but it was a while before we found one. In the meantime, Radio Mystery Theater came on, and they quickly became engrossed in it. I found a restroom. We stopped, and I told the kids, Okay, here's your restroom. Let's go. They had seemed sort of urgent, so I was surprised when they said, with their legs crossed, Can we please wait until this is off? Please, please. We waited until the show finished, then they hot-footed it to the restroom. What better testimony to the appeal of radio shows can I give? One of my favorites was the broadcast of the Sunday Funnies. Someone would read the comic strips and describe what was taking place in the pictures. It probably sounds silly to kids today, but we didn't get a paper, and I really looked forward to hearing the funnies. At Christmas time in the afternoons after school, Santa would come on the air direct from the North Pole and read letters from kids. I sent one or two, but he never read them. I don't remember what I asked for, but it was probably a gun and holster set or an electric train, which I had no hope at all of getting, so why not go right to the top? I enjoyed listening to Santa anyway, even if he didn't read my letters. I couldn't finish any account of radio shows without mentioning the old country music shows. They were especially popular in rural areas like ours. Most memorable were the Renfro Valley Barn Dance and the granddaddy of them all, the Grand Ole Opry, which is still alive and well today. The whole family would gather around the radio on Saturday night to listen to the Opry on WSN from Nashville. I enjoy television as much as anyone, but I wish there were still some radio shows on today. I think young people would still like them if they give them a chance. Huck Finn and Treasure Island. As far back as I can remember, I have loved to read. In school or at home, I read everything I could get my hands on. The only problem was that I didn't have much to choose from. My little one-room school had one small bookcase about two feet wide by three feet tall to cover all eight grades, so it didn't take long for me to go through those books. The main addition of new books in our home came from a second-hand store in town bought by some of my older brothers. Most of them would be collector's items now. There were Tom Swift books, Horatio Alger books, whole series of Boy Scout books, Motor Boy books, Motorcycle Chums books, and I read all of them. Back then, these collector items cost 10 cents or less. I don't know what happened to most of them, but I still have a couple and my brothers have several. When I started riding the bus to town in the seventh grade, there were lots of changes, lots of new things, but by far the best to me was the library. I discovered the library. From then on until I graduated from high school, I had several books checked out at all times. 
Now I had plenty of reading material during the school year. I traveled all over the world, through time, both forward and backward, through space, and had all sorts of adventures, all courtesy of books. Summer was another matter. I couldn't afford to buy books at the second-hand store very often and was usually short on reading material. Of the books I had at home, luckily two of them were my favorites. I read them each once each summer, and I think they should be required reading material for all 12-year-old boys. They were The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain and Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. I have read several other books by both authors and appreciated them all, but my favorite stayed the same. I suppose I identified with the boys in those books or wished I could have had the same adventures as they had. Huck Finn floated down the Mississippi through most of the book, having good times and bad as he went along. He was a free spirit and at the end of the book said that the widder aimed to civilize him and it was time to light out for Indian territory. I know I wouldn't have been quite like Huck, but it was great to daydream about it. I had it all figured out. Right from our farm, I could ride a raft all the way to New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. All I had to do was take the Levisa River to Louisa, the Big Sandy to the Ohio at Ashland, Kentucky, and the Ohio River to the mighty Mississippi, then on to New Orleans, downstream all the way. I never thought about the locks and dams I would have encountered that had been built since Huck's time. They would have presented a problem. Another of Mark Twain's books, Tom Sawyer, was where I was first introduced to Huck, but it did not grab me like Huckleberry Finn did. Huck Finn was on a more adult level, but still able to relate to young readers. In my first year of college, guess what we were assigned to do a report on? Huckleberry Finn. I could not only have done a report on it, I could have recited much of it from memory, but I read it again anyway. It has now been nearly 40 years since that last reading, and it's high time I read it again. When we had thunderstorms on Watermelon Hill, they were sometimes pretty wild, but in a way, I enjoyed them for the spectacular show that nature was putting on. We lived on a hill, and there were hills on either side of us and across the river, so there were plenty of surfaces for the thunder to bounce off of. A crash of thunder just kept on rolling with the help of the echoes and seemed amplified with all the bouncing it did. When I first read Huckleberry Finn, I took note of a passage when Huck and Jim, the runaway slave, were hiding out on the island. There was a huge thunderstorm, and when Huck talked about how grand it was, I realized that I felt the same way about a storm. I always enjoyed watching them, and still do. I now live in South Florida, where we sometimes have hurricanes, and as long as they don't take my house away, I enjoy watching them, too. I never did float down the river, except in my imagination, but I did that many times. My other childhood favorite, Treasure Island, also involves a young boy, Jim Hawkins, along with Long John Silver, pirate ships, buried treasure, 16 men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum, etc. Stuff made to order to hold a boy's interest and make him dream. This one I also read at least once each summer. As Kentucky is a long way from any ocean, I didn't figure out a way to sail off to a remote island and dig for pirate treasure, so I had to bury my own. A few times I made up a box of treasure and buried it, making a map so I could find it later. I don't really think any of the maps got a true test, though. I tried to make them cryptic enough to throw off anyone trying to find my treasure, but detailed enough so I could find it. The problem was that I would be too eager and would look for the treasure too soon while I still remembered where I buried it without needing the map. Either that or I would lose the map or forget where I hid it. Maybe I should have made two maps, one for the treasure and one to find where I hid the first map. Of course, I might have forgotten where I hid that one too, so maybe I should have made a third. Oh well. Watermelon Hill may have been a little isolated, but not as long as I had books to take me wherever I wanted to go. Adam's Grocery. 
For years, Adams Grocery in Louisa was our grocery store. It was located on Main Street across from the Cypress Inn. No longer there, it has gone the way of almost all small, non-chain grocery stores. Supermarkets have a much greater selection than Adams could have possibly had, but not the same charm. You could buy groceries, chat about the weather or the latest news, gossip, around town, buy feed for the animals, seed for planting, weigh yourself on the big scale in the back room, charge the groceries if you were a little short, and in general, just make yourself at home and visit while you were there. It was a small, narrow store. As you walked in the front door, the candy case was first thing on your left, then a long counter with shelves to the ceiling behind it containing canned goods, boxes of oatmeal, cereal, and other small grocery items. On the right were larger sacks of beans, rice, large cans of lard, hoes, garden plows, and other big items. In the back room were cracked corn for chicken feed, dairy feed for the horses and cows, midlands for the hogs, seed potatoes, seed corn, fertilizer, bug killers, and most of what a farm would need. Sometimes dad got feed from the big mill, but usually from Adams. You just helped yourself to what you needed and brought it to the counter. If you needed canned goods or anything else on the shelves behind the counter, the clerk had to get it for you. He had a long-handled gadget with pinchers on the end of it. He would reach up on the shelf, clamp onto the item, and set it down on the counter. If you wanted green beans or any other vegetable, there wasn't much of a selection. Usually there was only one or two brands of each thing. Cold cereal was cornflakes, Wheaties, Cheerios, or shredded wheat. Hot cereal was Quaker Oats, Ralston, or cream of wheat. The livestock feed in large sacks of flour and meal served double duty as clothing. The sacks were made of cotton print material in a variety of patterns, and Mom made most of my sister's and her own dresses from it. She would sometimes make some shirts for the boys from the sacks too, but most of the patterns were for girls. Any scraps not used for clothing found their way into our quilts. Some smaller sacks did not have patterns on them, but were not wasted. They were used for dish towels. Of course, my favorite part of the store as a kid was the candy case. It was sold by the pound or the stick or the piece. There were cinnamon balls, candy corn, Nico wafers, now and laters, whorehound sticks, peppermint, and a few others, but not a very large selection. I looked forward to going to the store because I might get some candy. I would usually get a small bag of something, but I had to choose because I could only get one thing. That was a hard choice, so I would usually keep my nose stuck to the glass case trying to decide while Mom and Dad were getting the groceries. Sometimes I would get maybe a nickel to buy what I wanted and would choose some different kinds of the penny candy or some chewing gum. If I got a pack of gum, I made it last for a week. I would never have more than one stick per day, and sometimes I would make a stick last for two days because there were only five sticks to a pack. Before meals, I saved my gum on the edge of my plate or some safe place and recovered it after I finished eating. I can't imagine there was any flavor whatsoever left in it after the first few hours, much less two days, but I still chewed it. Mr. Adams didn't have a cash register, just a cash drawer to keep the money in. Much of his business was charged. A lot of the customers were poor and struggled from one payday to the next or didn't have steady jobs, so they charged groceries and paid for them on payday. Some farmers had to charge until a crop came in, but whatever the reason, each customer had his or her own charge book. The charge sale was handwritten in it, and it was filed in a wooden box until next time. There may be some small stores in small towns today where you can still do that, but they are few and far between. Mr. Adams later sold the store to Jack Payne, one of our neighbors on Watermelon Hill, but nothing changed about the store. Mr. Payne years later went out of business and the store was torn down to make way for other businesses, but I'm sure some older people in Louisa still remember it fondly. All day meeting and dinner on the ground. 
Mom and dad belonged to the United Baptist Church. It was very different from most other sects of the Baptist Church in that they did not have Sunday school or music in church services. The Primitive Baptist Church was the only sect I know of which was more strict. The United Baptist had churches scattered all around the countryside, usually 20 to 40 miles apart, and they rotated Sundays so that there was a church at each location about once a month. The logic was that sometime during the month there would be services near all the members' homes. Some traveled to attend church at whatever location was due to have services, but there were a lot of people without cars, and if they couldn't get a ride, they only attended when services were at the church nearest to their home. I have not been in a United Baptist Church in many years, so I don't know if they have changed much or not. At that time, they were all simple wood frame rectangles, some with sconces on the wall to hold oil lamps, though most had electricity. Some had oil heaters, while others still had a potbelly stove in the middle of the floor burning coal to provide the heat. There were two aisles which left three seating sections. Up front on the right sat the older women and on the left the older men. These were usually older people because it was traditional to separate the men and women in this fashion and they stuck with tradition. In the middle section, there were usually couples who did not adhere to the segregated tradition. My parents and I always sat together. In the back of the room sat younger couples, teenagers, and sinners of varying degrees. Almost without exception, the members were kind, good people who would do anything for a friend or neighbor or even a stranger. The congregation ranged from business and professional people dressed in suits and ties to poor farmers dressed in their bib overalls because those were the only clothes they owned. They were all made welcome. Church was not a place to parade your new clothes and show off. The congregation was made up of fine people, but as a child, I did not enjoy going to church, and as I became a teenager, I found excuses not to go if possible. I would probably have been more satisfied if there had been more appeal to young people, but the services were directed primarily at adults. Sometimes they were even a little frightening to young children. The church did not believe in dancing, but during the services there was a lot of shouting, jumping up and down, and dancing all around that would rival a rock concert. They sang a lot of songs, but had no musical accompaniment. That might have been all right, but the songs were sung so slow, the words drawn out so long, that it was very hard to understand what they were saying. I remember one Sunday when an attractive, well-dressed young woman attended church. She was the daughter of one of the members, but had moved away from eastern Kentucky and was back home for a visit. She got up and sang Amazing Grace as a solo. Her voice was crystal clear, and it was absolutely beautiful. She did not drag out the words, as was usually done in the church, and I really enjoyed it. Since there was no Sunday school, the church service started at 10 a.m. The church did not have any one preacher. In fact, there might be three or four on any given Sunday. The preachers were as diverse as the congregation, ranging from businessmen to farmers, and dressed accordingly. They did not attend any theology schools, but had the calling, read the Bible, preached from it, and took it very literally. They were about as far as it would be possible to get from today's television ministers who try to squeeze every possible penny out of the poor people who watch them. Those old preachers did not get paid at all. They all had regular jobs and only preached because they felt that God had called them. I never saw a collection taken up unless it was for someone in the community whose house had burned down or had lost their job or had some other misfortune. They were truly good people. During the service, the extra preachers were all seated in back of the podium. Sometimes they would all take a turn. Sometimes one would say he didn't feel that he had anything to say that day and would keep his seat. With three or four preachers, the service seemed interminable, and to hear one of them turn down the opportunity to speak was music to my ears. Sometimes the service would last until 1 p.m. or later, and it was torture for me. The bathrooms were outhouses, and I welcomed the excuse to go since it got me outside for a while. I would try to drag it out for as long as possible without getting into trouble before going back inside. The only time I actually looked forward to going to church was when they had all-day meeting and dinner on the ground. 
There were more preachers than usual, and church service lasted quite a bit longer, but in the middle of the service was the dinner. It was not a catered affair, just a lot of good food brought by the women of the church, but it was delicious. Dinner was served on outdoor tables, which were usually just planks set up on sawhorses, and you sat wherever you could find a shady spot to eat. Mom was a great cook, but there was always dishes and desserts that were not in her repertoire, and I liked to try as many as possible. The only problem was trying to stay awake during the service in the afternoon after pigging out at dinner, especially with all the desserts lying heavy on my stomach. Even though I did not really enjoy my parents' church, it was a part of my childhood experience and played a part in molding my character. I had a lot of respect for the congregation as well as the uneducated farmers, preachers, who could speak as eloquently as any college professor when they got up to preach. Something had to be guiding them. We'll stop right there for this week. Another interesting peek into Sorry, I hit the camera into Dale's life there on Watermelon Hill. I, I love the beginning where he's talking about the radios. Uh, even in my lifetime, it, a drastic change, of course, in entertainment. You know, when I was growing up, of course, we did have TV and we got about three channels. Then you know today, if you have TV, how many different channels there is. I did listen to the radio a lot when I was growing up. I had a, a stereo in my room. Pap and Granny, Granny still has it. They had... Uh, when they first got married, I guess they got it. it was like one of those big console stereos. It's like wooden, kind of looks like a wooden chest, and the the top flips up like that. And it has a radio in it. Also has a record player. So I would at one time that that uh, stereo was in the kitchen, and there was a recliner by it. it Granny was doing work for Clifton Precision in those days, so she moved our kitchen table into the living room. They have a big living room, so there's plenty of room. And then that was her little area where she worked, where the it was right by a window, so the light come in. But then she had like a recliner and the, ste the stereo there. And I would lay in that recliner and listen to the stereo, you know, when I was probably middle school or something, and listen to... Uh, I was listening to music, not stories like Dale was talking about, but I was definitely daydreaming and thinking about stuff while I was listening. And then, of course, I had a, as I got older, I got a, I had record players. I remember I had a Holly Hobby record player, but then I got a nicer stereo, probably got it for Christmas or something. So I had, had music in my room and I could shut the door and listen. Um, so, but I love the, the stories though that he's talking about that how, and I've heard other accounts of that, how people love to hear uh, on the radio, they'd all gather around and listen, and I, you know, you've probably seen the paintings or drawings like Norman Rockwell's, where they're all gathered around, and that was where people not only got their entertainment, but of course got their news in those days. Pap told me so many memories about uh, listening to the end there, not necessarily about the stories like Dale talked about, but the music. So the Louisiana Hayride, of course the Grand Ole Opry, the Midday um, merry-go-round I think that was one so Pap was really impressed by all of the music and that really influenced his music as well that's where he he first heard the Blue Sky Boys and the Leuven Brothers and uh, the Delmore Brothers and all those people that influenced his style of, of music so I'm uh, really interested in that part also kind of neat that here you are today I know a lot of you may be looking at me while I read but a lot of you tell me they just you just listen you just listen so it's kind of like uh, I guess what's old is new again in one way. There's so many podcasters today talking about all kinds of things, you know, and I'm sure there's some just telling, I know there is, just telling stories. They may be uh, true stories or maybe stories from their lives or, you know, history kind of stories. Uh, there's those. Of course, there's people talking about, you know, whatever subject you can think of. Uh, but this is kind of like that, what I'm doing. I'm reading you a story. I'm not acting out all the parts and, and doing all the wonderful um, noises that Dale spoke of. I'm not doing any of that, the sound effects, but it still is kind of interesting that we're here today. This is what you're listening to me read about Dale talking about what he listened to on, a, on the radio when he was a boy and really enjoyed. Now, because I grew up in a home that was just full of music all the time, as I said, you know, listening to the radio, but records were really popular too. And we had, a, I'm sure Paul still has them, had several of Granny and Pap's old records, those 78s, I think it was the 78s that are kind of thick, that are thick 
Baker. And then Paul and I and my brother Steve had records. I remember me and Paul, I don't know if they were Paul's or mine, but had these little like books that had a little record in them. And then you could listen to the, it was Winnie the Pooh or Snow White or whatever it was. And you could listen to the record while you looked at the book. And I, I really loved music. And I would look at that time, the place in, in Murphy that you would go, there was no Walmart or anything like that, but it was Sky City. So Sky City had the little 45s. I would, every time we went, I would want to go pick out a little record if, if I had any money or if I could beg uh, Papa Granny to let me have it. So I would, I would pick out a little 45, whatever was popular of the day, you know. And I still have some of them. I've still got some of them put up somewhere. Of course, I don't listen to them. I don't have a record player today, but it's just hard to part with them thinking of all the times that I, I listen to them. It's probably the same with Dale, the one that, that he still has about Peter Rabbit. I'm also a reader like Dale was. I, I don't really remember how old I was when I become obsessed with reading. I would guess by the time I was in the fifth grade, something like that, I just really loved to read. I loved to lose myself in a book, just like he's describing. And, you know, like he said, you can you can live in a little mountain holler like I do or live on Watermelon Hill like he did, but you can go all over the world by reading, you know. Um, putting yourself in those, whether it's, a, a, you know, a kind of a biography or a, or a fiction story or whatever, you can experience all those things through the book. So I've always been a really voracious reader. And same as, as Dale, uh, my books, a lot of them come from school. I was lucky I had a bigger library than he did, uh, not as large as some of the ones today, but when I was a girl at Martins Creek st School, they had library, that school burnt down. And when it burnt down, when it burned, um, and I knew it the next morning, I think we heard like fire trucks and stuff at night way over on the highway, but going and, and however I knew the next day that it had burned, one of the first things I thought about was the books in the library. Even though I'd been gone a long time, I was grown, uh, but it was one of the first things I thought of. I remembered, I can even now picture when you walked in, what it all looked like, where my favorite books were. They had like a whole series. They were um, like orange covered. All the covers were orange hardback books, but they were biographies of maybe from, you know, Abraham Lincoln to... Uh, Pocahontas to whoever, uh, Florence Nightingale, and I read all those. I loved them. Uh, I loved just learning about people, the, all the different walks of life and the, you know, kind of important things they'd done. Of course, I loved the um, boxcar children, so that was, I can remember where they were at, and so I just always loved books. I was, you know, in changes in time it was much easier for me to get books for one thing you know probably there was more money going through pap and granny's hands not that we weren't poor we were but just in comparison to when dale was a child and then also just the stores there's more places to get them um, you know public libraries and um, thrift stores and and then people gather books and then they'll give them to you so anybody finds out you like to read usually you'll start sharing books back and forth so i had access to to a lot more books than dale did but today still i love to read hence why i'm reading to you i've always been a just a really avid reader now i like uh non-fiction things like i was talking about those biography but mostly i'm i love my great love is fiction i just love a good story love a good story but i i do love like dale's account of his life and um, I guess those kind of stories more the nonfiction that I like is still kind of a story but it's a person's life of course I have read nonfiction about whether it was about um, you know the beautiful landscape I live in the mountains the fauna and the creeks and the things like that always really interesting but at my heart I'm just a, I just love fiction and stories if they're like Dale's telling about his life uh, I am a storyteller, I guess, a lover of stories, and I am a storyteller. I liked the part about the excitement of getting to go to the store, to Adam's Grocery. So when I was growing up, mostly uh, the grocery store that Granny and Pap used was Ingalls. That's like a, um, it's not just in North Carolina, but I think it originated in North Carolina, but I know they have them also in, in Georgia and, and South Carolina, maybe other places, but was most likely was Ingalls. There was others, little groceries. I remember Howe's Grocery in downtown Murphy, A&P, but we never did shop at the A&P for some reason. But um, Granny kind of went once a week, and that's what I've always done, once a week or once every two weeks 
since Matt and I have been married, we didn't go a lot. So when you did get to go, it was kind of an exciting thing. And even to get to go to the store, because we didn't really go to the store much, like thinking of little country stores, uh, it was exciting to get to go as a child because you knew you probably might get a piece of candy, you might get a pack of bubble gum, uh, might get a chocolate bar or something like that, or a Coke. So exciting. I wonder if kids get that excited today because there's just, we just live in the, and me included, we just live in the land of plenty. It's just so different, drastically different from when Dale was a boy, but even different than when I was a girl. Uh, makes me wonder if, if kids, uh, Corey and Katie certainly felt like that. They got excited because again, I did, we just didn't go many places. We, we've always kind of been homebodies, but I wonder if kids feel that sense or if it's a lot of kids, I guess, get to uh, maybe go to the store every day if they, if they need something or if they have an opportunity to. And then, oh my goodness, dinner on the ground. That's just the best eating ever. It's when you go to a church function and you've got all those wonderful ladies uh, and some men that cook, but they bring all those from chicken and dumplings to all the pies and the uh, cakes and the you know, the corn straight out of the garden and their cornbread and their fried chicken. I mean, chicken, it's just, just all, it's just so good. Meatloaf, you just think of all the things because everybody brings their kind of their own favorites and then it's just kind of, you got everything. It, and like Dale said, you can really quickly overdo it if you don't watch it. I try to just get a little bit of, of what I what I see on the table that I like, but that's that's tough to do. You'll be for sure living out Pap's saying of your eyes will be bigger than your belly if you don't if you don't watch it. But that is absolutely the best eating ever. Best. Uh, no restaurant compares to any of the dinner on the grounds that I've been to. Then this is the time of the year that they're really popular in my area because churches are having decoration days where people come in to decorate the graves. Uh, they're having homecoming, which means it's kind of like people that have, maybe the, they grew up in that church, but they had to move away. Then they'll come back for homecoming and, and usually you'll have a big meal for that. So this is the time of the year to enjoy those wonderful meals. So I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave me a comment and tell me what was your favorite parts what jumped out at you and as always i hope you drop back by next friday so we can see what happens next with dale on watermelon hill